We see the Dodgers as a huge rival, but their fans don't see us the same way. We'll tell you how that can change. The city of San Diego proposing major increases in density throughout University City by more than doubling or even tripling the number of housing units. We have reaction. More questions tonight from the family of a woman killed in a car crash in Claremont last week. Plus, protests at today's L.A. City Council meeting and calls for three council members to step down. The SeaWorld rescue team is helping a marine animal start a new chapter. CBS 8 News Live at 6 starts now. All eyes are on L.A. tonight. In less than an hour, the Padres will face off against the Dodgers in a Wild West playoff showdown. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Carla Chiquetto. I'm Marcella Lee. We have live team coverage. We'll check in with John Howard in just a couple of minutes. As the excitement builds for Friars fans, people in L.A. may have a completely different take. CBS 8's Steve Price starts our coverage tonight. For Padres fans, there is no team we love to hate more than the Dodgers. Exactly, beat L.A. But according to L.A. Times columnist Bill Plaschke, this rivalry is being driven down a one-way street. Dodgers fans consider us more of an annoying bump on the road than someone to fear down the freeway. To left field and Profar going back as Will Smith leaves the yard. This certainly hasn't helped. We played the Dodgers 19 times this season and they won 14. In today's paper, the LA Times headline calls us the adorable little Padres. With Plaschke writing, there is one significant problem with this feisty, frothing, fearsome rivalry between the Dodgers and San Diego Padres. It's not a rivalry. The Padres fans see the Dodgers and immediately break into passionate boos. The Dodgers fans see the Padres and immediately think, hey, we should plan our next weekend trip to Del Mar. You got to beat them. I mean, that's 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 the only thing they'll respect is if we start beating. High drive to right field. Tony Gwynn Jr. says while it may take L.A.'s fans a while to come around, the Dodgers players saw what we just did to the Mets. They know that this team is playing a little bit different than they were the last time last time they faced off and they know that if they they don't come out and play their best baseball they can get beat comes on a 3-1 that one is laced randy jones calls this one of the best padres teams he's ever seen this is a major league baseball club that can contend and it has the potential to win a world series while padres fans are keeping the faith dodgers fans are keeping cocky with plashke writing if folks in San Diego view Los Angeles as this giant mythical reptile that is casting a 130 mile shadow, folks in Los Angeles view San Diego as a quaint little lizard that harmlessly darts around the porch. We're just not a bump in the road. I mean, these guys can flat play, you know, and you, you, you let your guard down and, and this pottery team will light you light your butt up. And let's be honest, winning our first World Series will be even sweeter when it includes knocking the Dodgers out of the playoffs. Beat LA, come on, let's go. Steve Price, CBS 8. Love hearing from Randy. <laughs> Very interesting, the two perspectives. Uh, and tonight we are only about 30 minutes away from first pitch. Fans here are focused on the Padres, the playoffs, and World Series dreams. John Howard joins us live from LA tonight where the excitement is building, John. Yes, I'm here at Dodger Stadium. It's hard to find the Padres fans. <laughs> there are very few of them, but the ones that come in are very excited about this matchup. I have been waiting for this since the trade deadline, and the Padres and Dodgers have met several times since then. The Dodgers have dominated the series all season long. Both managers say, hey, it doesn't matter what happened in the regular season, even though the Dodgers knocked off the Padres 14 of 19 times. And even though tonight's Dodgers starting pitcher, Luis Arias, is 3-0 and against the Padres this year with an ERA of 1.5, which is minuscule, and the Padres hitters will have their work cut out for them. All of that doesn't matter. Now, the Padres made those big trades at the trade deadline. The Dodgers made a big one in the offseason, bringing in Freddie Freeman. Here's Freddie talking about the atmosphere here in the postseason. It's just kind of like the first day of spring training. Everyone's excited, ready to roll. So um, this is what you work for all season long. And to, to be able to get into that chance, is, it's, it's what you asked for. 
I think it's the way we work pitchers. Um, even if you throw five shutout innings against us, you're going to be at 100 pitches, usually 105 pitches, and you're out, and then you got to ask four relievers to be on their A game as well. So I think that's a very tall task to do. Um, I mean, you, you, sometimes we've had Cody Bellinger hit nine. He's a former MVP that can change a game in one swing. Yeah, forgive me on the hack of Urias' first name. It's Julio Urias, not Luis. But back here at Dodger Stadium, a lot of excitement. They're expecting over 50,000 fans. It's a huge stadium. It'll be a lot of fun to watch what happens. Best of five series, three game winners go in advance to place the winner of the Phillies or the Atlanta Braves. Big crowd for a big game. Hopefully you'll see some friendly fans, a few more of them yes. up there, John, as we uh, as we get closer to game time. Yeah, no doubt about it, uh, but it's going to be a big, heavy Dodger fan base. No doubt about that. Of course. Just wait till Friday. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chad. Much more serious news. A sexually violent predator will soon be heading home to uh, heading to a home in Hakumba Hot Springs. Today, a judge approved the conditional release of 71 year old William Stafford in November. He'll be moved from a state hospital to a home on Old Highway 80. Stafford was convicted of numerous offenses that happened between 1968 and 1990. He is the fifth sexually violent predator to be released to the desert community. City planners have recently unveiled a plan to add a lot more housing to University City. Some saying it will transform that area into another downtown. CBS 8's Brian White talked with people who live there and heard their concerns, as well as reasons from the city about why they're going big in University City. The city of San Diego is proposing major increases in density throughout University City by more than doubling or even tripling the number of total housing units. And that has people living around here worried about their quality of life. Where are the children going to play? Where's our neighborhood going to go? I'm very concerned about what's going on. Pablo Lanata bought a home with his wife and children in UC less than two years ago, and he's upset about the massive development being proposed here. Through hard work, and a lot of sacrifices, we were able to eventually afford a house, thinking that we could, you know, build that American dream. But with such insane growth uh, here in UC proposed by the city, that may be impossible. Other neighbors agree. It's the unknown. It's really not knowing what this is going to look like. Here's what the city is proposing to add over the next few decades to the 27,000 homes already in University City. The first scenario would add 56,000 new homes, which is more than triple the current number. The second scenario would add 35,000 homes, which is more than double. Well, there's certainly going to be a lot more traffic. Marion Nebaker is wondering how the roads in UC are going to fit all the new cars and traffic. Well, in a September 29th meeting of the Planning Commission, the city indicated they're relying on other forms of transportation to support this growth. We want to improve biking conditions. We want to improve first and last mile trolleys, uh, connections to the trolley. There are numerous bus lines and five trolley stops in UC, and it's obvious the city sees an opportunity here for what they see as smart density growth around public transit. I reached out to the city, and planning director Heidi Von Blum responded with this statement, which reads in part, quote, This is just one opportunity in addition to many other citywide initiatives to add this much-needed capacity for new homes in a high-resource area located near the region's recent multi-billion dollar investment in the new trolley line. More homes near jobs and education with good access to transit also helps the city achieve its fair housing and climate goals. Meanwhile, people living here now think these plans are going to change the character of the community. Well, I think they're trying to make it another downtown, and this is certainly not why we moved to University City. The city's proposal is part of the University Community Plan update, which will eventually need approval from City Council. In University City, I'm Brian White for CBS 8. Thanks, Brian. Local leaders and caregivers are coming together to address the county's long-term care crisis. Dozens with the in-home supportive services program rallied outside the county administration building this morning. Their contract is up at the end of the year and they are now asking the county to increase their wages. Right now they're set to get a 50 cent per hour increase bringing them to $16 an hour, but they say they want closer to 20. I think all of us deserve to make a living wage. And since we're supposed to be county people, we deserve to be recognized for that. 
bargaining talks are set to begin, the Board of Supervisors has previously voiced their support for caregivers. In L.A. tonight, there are protests and calls for three city council members to resign. This comes one day after the council president stepped down over a leaked audio with racist and profane comments about other leaders and a councilman's child. Mark Strassman has more tonight from Los Angeles. Protesters crowded Los Angeles City Council chambers, demanding former Council President Nuri Martinez and two other council members resign immediately. The uproar, a response to Martinez especially, making profane and racist statements during a closed-door redistricting meeting that was secretly recorded. It's not us. It's the white members on this council that will motherfuck. The audio recordings obtained by the LA Times captured Martinez talking to local labor leader Ron Herrera and fellow council members Gil Cedillo and Kevin DeLeon. At one point, Martinez discusses the black child of Mike Bonin, a white city council member. In Spanish, she calls the boy a little monkey. There's nothing you can do to control him. She goes on to complain about the child's behavior at an MLK parade. Even like a little white kid, which I was like, this kid is a beat down. Like, let me, let me take him around the corner and then I'll bring him back. I'm a dad who loves his son in ways that words cannot capture. Bonin said he and his husband and, are and, and, raw and angry and heartbroken and sick over the remarks. These people stabbed us and shot us and, and cut the spirit of Los Angeles. Herrera, the labor leader, resigned his post overnight. Martinez was a no-show at Tuesday's council meeting, but released a statement saying she's taking a leave of absence, adding, I realize this is entirely of my own making, but for many, it's not enough. This ends today. That's this right. ends okay. right now. Step down. You do not deserve your role. That's right. We need someone better. Yes. Get out. LA's mayor and the two candidates running to succeed him say all three council members should resign. Mark Strassman, CBS News. Los Angeles. More are joining those calls. President Biden and Councilman Mike Bonin, who you heard from there and whose son was the subject of the offensive comments, are also calling on the three to resign. Cedillo and DeLeon attended the meeting this morning, but they left before Bonin spoke. Still ahead tonight, the family of a woman killed in a car crash in Claremont say they have questions that are not being answered. Plus, the film that's putting the spotlight on human trafficking at this year's San Diego International Film Festival. Gorgeous view looking out from Otay Mountain as we go into this evening. Now we got some downpours to talk about as well as some passing clouds, even potentially seeing a little bit more action by tomorrow. All those details are coming up. Carla. But first, growing pushback tonight against a plan to cut the rooftop incentive program for solar panels.